Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are you all today? So thank you for joining us today. Um, colleagues, I just have a brief introduction of Tom. Um, and I'll start out by saying it's a great pleasure to be invited to introduce Provost Thomas Poon to you today. Um, we have developed a very collaborative and respectful relationship over this year. He has been very attentive to our concerns as faculty and imagined ways in which we can solve the challenges presented thoughtfully. The Faculty Senate Executive Committee and I appreciate the ongoing dialogue uh, well, it's like I'm 15. Um, <laughs> we have had a, this academic year. So a few things, a few fun facts about Tom. Provost Poon joined LMU in 2017. As provost, he is responsible for the academic affairs, student affairs, and enrollment management divisions at the university. He is also a tenured professor in chemistry and established the website ochem.com in 1999 to provide useful learning resources for organic chemistry. Provost Poon earned his PhD in chemistry at UCLA. Oh, yeah. we're alums. Um, <laughs> and his Bachelor of Science at Fairfield University, a sister Jesuit institution. Since Provost Poon's appointment in 2017, LMU has expanded the pool of nationally recognized faculty by creating 25 new tenure track uh, faculty positions and hiring over 120 tenure line faculty across the Westchester campuses, colleges, and schools. Undergraduate enrollment has grown by 14%, and LMU's graduate offerings have increased with the addition of new programs in business analytics, management, performance, pedagogy, online educational leadership, and global entrepreneurial management. Dr. Poon has supported, developed, and led a broad range of academic and social justice initiatives in his higher education career, and strives to create a campus environment that will form a new generation of ethical leaders who identify, analyze, and respond to the most challenging problems facing our rapidly changing society. And if this is your first time attending one of Provost Poon's convocations, you will see before you, we will be <laughs> blessed with a performance later today dis displaying his musical prowess. Oh, God. Pressure's on now. If not often, I'm upstaged by a ukulele. <laughs> please join me. I'm not on stage that often. Um, please join me in welcoming Executive Vice President and Provost Thomas Poon for his 2023 convocation address. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. You're awesome. Oh, thank you, Professor Weavers. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah, good morning still. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, yeah, it, it has really been an amazing year, and um, it's, it's really, I feel like it's, it's a year that we're fully back, fully back back, right? To quote one of the deans, Robin, are you there? <laughs> All right, Ooh. oh, I don't need this. Maybe that's where the feedback's coming from. Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you for coming. Um, in case I forget to mention it at the end, uh, there is a lunch that will be available in Hannon Court, right over here to your left, right, in the courtyard of uh, LSB, Life Sciences Building, the Featherstone Life Sciences Building. So um, please uh, uh, enjoy each other's company. Um, you know, you can gather, uh, make fun of all the things I say, and, and uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, let's see if this is working. Okay, so I first want to start with our land acknowledgement. Uh, it's important that we acknowledge the Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar and the presence of LMU on this traditional, ancestral, and unceded land. And we and I am very grateful to have the opportunity to live, create, and be in this place. And if you want to read a wonderful article on the importance of land acknowledgments, uh, uh, Ernesto Colleen and Brenda Nicolas have uh, written a wonderful one. And there's the, the link there. But you can Google that uh, on our website, or you can search for it on our website. OK. So today I'm going to, you know, last year I talked about the strategic plan, uh, kind of introduced the various parts of it, gave some examples 
of, of things that were going on in each of the areas of the spotlights. This year, uh, I'm going to focus on our commitments. So, uh, and so this will be an update on the three commitments. I'm going to, we have a commitment to anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm going to talk about those areas, including how we uh, are trying to address systemic racism on campus. And then when we achieve some of those, we uh, produce some outcomes. And I'll try to share some of those with everyone. We have two other commitments. One is to innovation and adaptability and extending our reach beyond the bluff. And uh, we have accomplishments in those areas as well. And then I will acknowledge many folks. And uh, as, as Professor Weaver has mentioned, I will attempt to do a musical tribute. So <laughs> I wanted to mention, first off, that the overarching theme of this convocation address is collaboration. Uh, I'm really privileged to be in the vantage point that I'm in because I personally get to collaborate with so many leaders at the university, uh, so many folks at the university, faculty, staff, and students, right? And what struck me when I was putting this convocation together was the tremendous amount of collaboration that produced many of the successes and results that I'm going to present. So that's the overarching theme, so please keep that in mind. I'm also going to start off by introducing the concept of shared equity leadership. So the American Council on Education has put out uh, a series of pamphlets on this concept. And so I'll go through the who, what, how. Uh, so shared equity leadership applies to all of the multiple stakeholders at a university, right? Faculty, staff, students, uh, 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 board members, right, alumni. And it's these stakeholders coming together to have influence over agenda setting and decision making. Uh, the what? So it has three main elements, right? One is that individuals in an organization have undergone a personal journey towards what they call critical consciousness. Um, you can, you know, please take a second right now to think about your journey uh, of critical consciousness in DEI and justice, right? Um, we have all experienced critical consciousness together as well in the last few years, and there will be some examples of that. Then there are values shared among the members of uh, the leadership team or the group, the community, and then a set of practices that we enact and enable, right, so that we can share this leadership uh, amongst our community. I really feel that we we have exemplified this in the last couple of years. And the why is obvious. As we know, interventions to support minoritized groups uh, and students have not been successful at scale, right? Not writ large in academia, not writ large in our society. And they often operate through deficit mindsets, right? So this burden often gets placed on our minoritized communities, and that is why we need to have a shared equity leadership approach. So the how, it's really uh, using this notion, they claim, of this personal journey towards critical consciousness. So I'm gonna attempt to maybe take us through that journey uh, in, the, in these slides. So we're gonna talk about our anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion commitment first. And this will be the bulk of, of the convocation, actually, uh, because I'm very proud that we have done so much together in this space. So it's important to remember, right? We remember the brutal murder of George Floyd and our community coming together, right, in solidarity. Uh, multiple communities across the nation and even globally came together uh, in solidarity uh, with this movement. On our campus, we received demands. We had very uh, difficult but important meetings uh, with stakeholders. And we had keynote addresses and other presentations that helped us to understand. And I will never forget Dr. Cheryl Grills when she presented 
the fact that our nation has continually reacted to incidents, events, uh, and challenges with the black community, passing laws, bills, um, court decisions, right? And yet we were where we were in the summer of 2020, right, where, where police brutality could still happen to a, to a black man and others, right, as, as we know. That really struck me because what this speaks to is the need for systemic change, more systemic change. We remember that we galvanized as a community. We created DEI committees across all different sectors at the university, right? And then we remember that there was lots of communication, right? We met with affinity groups. Affinity groups met. They met with leadership, um, town halls and listening sessions. Uh, President Snyder established the Presidential Black Leadership Advisory Council. We were more transparent than ever, right? Providing access to constituencies, to leadership, and other groups, right? We posted our demands online, on our website, and we're not gonna take them down because we want to remember. It's so important for our critical consciousness that these demands stay up on our website. And we report it out, right? So we have uh, an entire webpage uh, devoted to our progress with these demands and other progress. We report it out with um, um, a systemic analysis report out sessions, two years worth where all those different units that you saw on the previous slide that created these committees, uh, DEI committees, they came together to report out on, on their progress to date on their DEI work. And there's just two examples, uh, one from Seaver College here. And then, of course, uh, you know, it's, it, it, start, it ends at the top, right? President Snyder committed to an anti-racist campus. And he established the LMU Anti-Racism Project. And if you go to the website, uh, you can see that there are various areas and aspects of this anti-racism project. And, um, and it continually gets updated. But one thing that I know those of you who have been here for a while know about LMU is that you know, our LMU, our, our DEI efforts are grounded in our mission, right? We are a distinct Catholic institution. We have three founding orders, um, and that enriches us in so many ways. Uh, you know our mission. And two people that I want to uh, really talk about here are uh, former vice president for um, Intercultural, um, uh, intercultural affairs, thank you. <laughs> and um, uh, former Vice President for Mission and Ministry, Bob Carroll and Abby Robinson Armstrong. So they really committed to working together for their two areas to work together. When I arrived here in uh, 2017, I overlapped with Abby uh, and I really saw this collaboration uh, in full force right, and the legacy that they left, and the legacy that they left to our new, uh, our current leaders, uh, Emma de la Pena and John Sebastian, and they also are very collaborative as well. So they're continuing this tradition, uh, which is so important for our DEI efforts. And in fact, I asked them, you know, uh, would you please send me some of uh, your updates on DEI efforts, especially ones that involved uh, strong collaborations among the LMU community. And so they did. And so uh, uh, Vice President De La Pena sent me about six of them, and I list them all here. And what you'll see in parentheses with each of these are all of the offices or individuals who collaborated to make or are making these, these projects and these initiatives work, right? So faculty leadership development and new approaches to hiring for mission and inclusive excellence. Uh, we're undertaking an effort to expand our DEI definitions 
And so um, uh, 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 Vice President De La Pena mentioned that I should inform all of you that a survey is going out soon, possibly next week or very shortly thereafter. Uh, keep a lookout for that because we're going to need your help, right, to expand these DEI definitions. Uh, tracking of DEI training, you can see all the folks who are involved in this. Uh, uh, generative conflict workshop series, I believe that has some, some grant funding uh, associated with, with it. And then the last thing is a, a DEI data working group that uh, was established uh, by President Snyder, and they've been working since 2020 to identify different variables, examine uh, collective processes, and one thing that is going to be launched, I think, next week is our first DEI dashboard, right? Because this was part of some of the demands, more transparency in our data. And you can see the folks who worked on this, and I want to thank uh, Jennifer belicheski larson who chaired the committee. Uh, the fruits of their labor are going to start to, to come out, right? So next week, we are going to release the DEI dashboards for faculty. It'll look something like this, right? You can't really read this, but what this shows is uh, our full professors by gender, right? Male on top, women on the bottom, and you can see that they're converging, right? We're not there yet, but we're moving in a good direction. And you will be able to, um, you will be able to parse this data, right? You'll be able to parse it by college, by department, right? By full-time or part-time status by tenure line or non-tenure line, right, by the different ranks. So um, this, is, this is going to be very exciting for those of you who want a deeper look into our, our progress. Uh, after the faculty DEI dashboards are released, we're, we're currently working on the staff and the student one now. So those will roll out as soon as they're done as well. So thank you, uh, Dr. De La Pena. I'm not sure if you're here. Uh, how about a round of applause for her and her unit? Yes, you. Yes, you. <laughs> so Vice President Sebastian uh, sent me some items as well, and I was just blown away also, right? So in Campus Ministry, they created a lecture series celebrating National Black Catholic History Month and invited some amazing speakers, musicians, um, uh, it was wonderful. Hope you had a chance to attend those. Uh, they're starting up the faculty staff immersion trips again, right? And this year they're going to South Africa and Namibia. Um, how many of you are going on that? Raise your hand. Yeah, a few of you in this room and, and others. Yes, so that's going to be transformative as they have been in the past. Uh, the Center for Sp uh, Religion and Spirituality created a certificate in contemporary black Catholic spirituality. So uh, addressing the needs of uh, that community. And then ACTI, the Academy of Catholic Thought and Imagination, celebrated the work of John August Swanson, who celebrates his Mexican heritage in his artwork. And then this one was especially uh, poignant for me. Um, John Sebastian told me that uh, uh, the position of coordinator for Muslim student life was upgraded from half time to full time in recognition of our growth in the Muslim student population here on campus. And uh, in light of Ramadan beginning today, I want to wish uh, all, all of our Muslim community a very generous uh, Ramadan. So thank you, John and Emmeline, for your collaborative work in this space. It, it's truly been uh, incredible and transformative for us. Yeah, <laughs> round of applause. So I'm going to talk about uh, some of our uh, ways that we've tried to address systemic racism here on campus. And I was in Mass uh, two weeks ago, two Sundays ago, and the gospel really uh, spoke to me because it was from John and and among the gospel passage, it read that uh, Jesus, Jesus was uh, with a Samaritan woman, right? And he asked her for a drink of water. And they started having a conversation about the water, 
And Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, meaning the water in the well. But whoever drinks the water I give shall never, will, uh, will never thirst, right? The water, I, the water I shall give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And this resonated with me because it, it reminded me of systemic change, right? Because those who commit to the water of eternal life will never be thirsty, right? When we commit to real systemic change, right? That is when our, our eternal thirst, our long-standing needs are quenched, right? That, that's how we do it, through systemic change. And I believe some of the examples I shared already of the, the, the successes that uh, Vice President De La Pena and Vice President Sebastian uh, shared with us are examples of systemic change, right? Creating dashboards so that we will evermore have transparency. Uh, changing our data definition, right, for demographic groups. That is a systemic change. Create, uh, upgrading a half-time position to a full-time position. That's a systemic change. And it, it will have lasting impacts on the university. And so I want to share some other systemic changes that I believe that we've made and committed to here at the university. And again, I just want to remind you, this is part of our commitments uh, in our strategic plan. Okay? So I think there are three broad categories. One is through words, right? We routinely, from students, faculty, staff, uh, leadership, we routinely use the words Black Lives Matter. We routinely use the word anti-racism. That is not true at all universities. It's not even true at all Jesuit universities, which I sadly learned. Men and women, to be more gender inclusive, we have, a, we have uh, really tried hard to use persons, right, whenever we can. Uh, one uh, prime example of this is in our alma mater song. So verse six was men and women all for others. We went back to Kelly Younger, Professor Kelly Younger, who uh, wrote this, this verse and asked him if he would mind making it more gender inclusive, and he did, willingly and, and happily. Um, we changed the name of the Office for Intercultural Affairs to Diversity Equi Office of Inter uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. When our candidates were interviewing for this position, they told us, almost to a person, how important that name was to them and how it, it was partially responsible for convincing them that LMU got it and this was a place they wanted to be. We're addressing systemic racism through images. Uh, if you've been in University Hall, you may have seen that many of our old photos uh, and other imagery uh, has been replaced or taken down. Um, we have a inclusive history and images project that is led by Dean Brian Alexander and Chancellor Mike Ng of the Society of Jesus. They are the co-chairs, and you can see the members of this committee. And uh, I know firsthand because uh, Dean Alexander always tells me that he might have to leave Dean's council a little early to get to the committee meeting. Um, that this, this committee is working really hard, right? Um, uh, uh, you know, because it seeks to import, uh, address important gaps in understanding our institutional history by gathering stories and images uh, from alumni and the greater LMU community to tell the full and inclusive LMU story. So I, I can't wait to see uh, the work that comes out of this committee as we go forward. And then the third category is that we're, we're addressing systemic racism through actions. So last year, uh, uh, or now it's two years ago, whew, time flies. But there was a, a faculty senate motion, right, where the faculty asked us to incorporate, made a recommendation to incorporate DEI into our promotion and tenure standards, right? In other words, they thought that, they saw that DEI could be part of 
one's teaching portfolio, one's research portfolio or scholarship portfolio, and one's service portfolio. But never before had that work been formally recognized in the promotion and tenure process. And so they made this recommendation that we do that. And so working with the deans, we made it our goal to incorporate DEI work and accomplishments and recognition into each and every department's DEI uh, uh, promotion and tenure standards, right? And I'm really happy to say that we are almost there. I think we're 87% there. There are about eight departments that still have some work to do on this, but eight out of 40, 48 departments, right? This is incredible. This is groundbreaking work in higher education. You will be hard pressed to find a university that has done this writ large at the institution and that has incorporated it in such a thoughtful way that our, our faculty have. I'll just give you some examples, right? So in sociology for scholarship, right? The, the candidate can make the case that DEI related work uh, that appears in any venue demonstrating impact, I love that, any venue, right? That could be a journal article, a book, a conference, right? Um, and different means of dissemination. In econ, right, acknowledging that, uh, you know, there will be acknowledgement for DEI-related works, and then, and then how it can be acknowledged. Tremendous uh, and unheard of in higher ed. Teaching. Uh, the department consider ways that faculty, a faculty member has gone above and beyond their conventional teaching responsibilities, right, in order to enrich student learning and experience. Faculty have been asking for this, faculty of color and minoritized faculty, women, have been asking for this for ages. And we are finally doing it here at LMU. And uh, kudos to the faculty. And then, of course, service as well. All right. More actions. We decided to devote space to our black students and our black community. So we have the Mbangi spot, and if you haven't seen it, it's amazing. And what they've done with it is also amazing. And this was a, a collaborative, collaborative effort between Student Affairs and uh, the, the EVP for Administration, Lynn Scarborough, and, uh, and her team getting the space ready, right? And of course, Student Affairs with the programming for the space. Uh, just incredible. And then you may have seen this. This was just announced this week. Uh, we have announced formally that we are creating a Dream Center. When, uh, and, and this was the, let me see where I want to go with this. Let's go here. So, the director position for the Dream Center was just posted today. Yeah. And it's a unique position because it has, it doesn't have a supervisor and a dotted line. It has two supervisors, right? So student affairs, Terry Mangione, vice president for student affairs and dean of students, and Jose Badenez, associate, associate provost for undergraduate education, will be the co-supervisors of the director because uh, it's so important that we have uh, this collaboration between student affairs and academic affairs for our undocumented students. And of course, they are gonna be collaborating with other units as well, right? Um, and I really wanna thank uh, the, the faculty and staff who worked on this. You know, there was, uh, President Snyder uh, created a, a working group to come up with recommendations. And that working group was chaired by uh, Dean Mangione and Will Perez from the School of Education. And uh, there are other folks on the, the working group. But then when we started planning this and meeting to talk about the recommendations, uh, other faculty and staff joined along too. And um, it was such an educational experience. But I have to give a special shout out to my thought partner on this, uh, Senior Vice President Kawana Leggett, who's over there.
So uh, it was in the fall that I went to um, SVP Leggett and said, Kwana, you know, uh, uh, should we do this, right? Can, can you advise me on this? And she said, oh, absolutely. We're, we're doing it, right? And so, um, and we're doing it. And so this is going to be, you know, it's a work in progress, right? We've dedicated space. We, we've dedicated staffing. And uh, this first year is going to be a big learning experience, but hopefully very impactful for our undocumented, documented uh, students and their faculty. Okay. And then, you know, this picture just tickles me because um, I was in uh, the Crimson Lion, and I learned that Dean Crabtree had organized a meeting of ethnic studies chair, right, in academics in BCLA, and all the EIS, the ethnic and intercultural uh, um, uh, services staff uh, leaders, right, in student affairs. And they were having a great lunch and talking about possible ways to collaborate, again, with this theme, right? There's so much collaboration going on. And that collaboration, it results in all of these support systems, right? Support systems for our black community, for our Hispanic and Latine or Latinx community, right? In support of our Asian community. And, uh, you know, this isn't meant for you to be able to read everything. You can always go back, watch the video, pause it if you want. But um, I'm really proud of, like I said before, right? This is in our DNA. It's in our mission, our DNA, and we have done this, and we have created new ones as well. And so I just wanted to honor everyone who has worked on this by, by showing these, these uh, supports that we have uh, at LMU. Okay, more action, right? So we are in the quiet phase of a capital, a comprehensive campaign, and our very first campaign theme is inclusive and access. And so that involves raising money for scholarships and financial aid, student success and retention initiatives, uh, identity and affinity living learning communities, right? And faculty cluster hires, right? So we are committed to this uh, in our fundraising shop as well. And hats off to uh, Senior Vice President Peter Welch. I'm not sure if he's here, but hats off to him. Oh, right there in the front. <laughs> All right, and you know when you when you do true systemic change, when you when you make progress in it, you get good op outcomes. And I'm going to share some of these good outcomes with you. Okay, so the Chronicle had this article back in December about how they're predicting U.S. Uh, institutions of higher learning will never reach racial parity. Right? What do they mean by that? Well, 35% of our population. Uh, is underrepresented minorities, right? And so um, they think we will never reach that in higher ed, 35% faculty of color, okay? So if you look at where we've come, right, since 2016, we have made progress. If you look at the, uh, the bar on the right, that uh, represents our white and Caucasian faculty, right? And you can see that we're steadily diversifying the faculty. If you, if you add up the numbers of Asian, black or African American, and Hispanic and Latino faculty, we're at, it looks like, 28.4%. We're getting there, right? So I don't believe the Chronicle that we won't reach what they call parity. We're making progress. Our deans, um, almost, yeah. Hats off to the dean. So much of what I am presenting today uh, is in partnership and because of the deans and their commitment to DEI. Uh, and also, I just want to, um, you know, in celebration uh, of uh, Women's History Month, let me just share a, a couple of statistics and updates on, on how we compare, right? So nationally, there are around 208,000 college professors in the US. And the ratio of women to men is 43 to 57. At LMU, it's 51 to 49, all right? Yes. 
And there, there are actually 58% women in deanships in higher ed, and that was in 2021. At LMU, we have 70%, yeah. Now there's another statistic about colleges and universities, that's student statistics, right? Uh, interestingly enough, uh, women on average outnumber men 60 to 40 uh, on college campuses. Um, at LMU, it's 53 to 47, right? Uh, but I do want to talk about student data, right? And I'm going to talk about uh, race and ethnicity data. So this goes back to uh, uh, fiscal year, that's what F stands for, fiscal year 16, right? And so, um, and if, in case you don't know what that means, that means we start the fall in 2016, oh no, sorry, start the fall in 2015, and then spring 2016, okay. So one thing you'll see is that we've grown our enrollment, of course, right? And if you keep that in mind, it's very difficult to grow your enrollment and at the same time grow your diversity, right? Or even to keep it steady. So the percentages are the percent of the student population. That's what the percentages represent. So you can see with our Asian students, we, we dropped a little bit you know, by 1%, but we've kept it at 10%. We've been able to do that. Uh, with our black or African American students, uh, we've been able to grow just a little bit, but keep it at 7% uh, while we're growing. You can see we went from 387 to 506, right? Under the graph, you can see the, that percentage is the absolute percentage increase from fiscal year 16 to fiscal year 22, okay? But the number on the right, this is the one I wanna point out because there are some outcomes related to this. So uh, we are at 24% Hispanic and Latino students right now, right? That is very close to the 25% that's needed to become a Hispanic serving institution, which is our goal, okay? But an interesting thing happened, maybe, it, was it last week or two weeks ago? It was last week. An interesting thing happened. So um, we received a letter. Oh, and by the way, these successes, you know, enrollment management, marketing and communications, uh, advancement, finance, essentially everyone is responsible for this, right? But this is the thing that happened last week. We received a letter from the Department of Education informing us that we are now eligible for Title III funding. This is funding that traditionally uh, only goes to HSIs, right? We can now apply for this. How is that possible? We're not an HSI yet. I wanna make that clear. We're close. Well, it's possible because Kat Weaver and Angie Rochat read the requirements to be eligible for this and found that our data, you know, the number of undergraduates we have, the supports that we offer them, right, their success, their graduation rate and retention success, right, um, uh, of, of our Hispanic undergrads fit their formula. So guess what? They, they asked. They, they presented a case to the DOE and the DOE said yes. So this is awesome, yeah. And so we are immediately eligible for Title III grants, uh, which su uh, support uh, low-income students. And then as soon as we reach 25%, we'll be eligible for those Title V grants, right, which support Hispanic students. So amazing outcome. Thank you, Kat and Angie. And then when, you, when, you, when you're making systemic change and people see it, right, it leads to fundraising success and grant success, okay? So these are just some of the grants that we've received in the last two years. And I, I'm convinced that if we had not made so much progress uh, responding to the demands, and we're not done yet, of course, by any means, right? We admit that. But we've made progress, and other folks have seen that we've made progress. So I'm just gonna put the PIs up there, right? You can see this, 
the, 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 the uh, faculty and staff who have worked on these grants to get these grants, bring them to LMU, they have come from all different areas of the university, right? Amir Hussein from the Lilly Foundation, right? Addressing uh, the needs of our region um, in pastoral uh, education. Uh, Norma Romero with uh, these TRIO grants that she's so good at getting, right? And we, we got Two others this year, well, we had McNair, we, we renewed that, right? Liz Wimberly is, is the PI on that. And um, Associate Provost Badenes uh, got us for the first time this TRIO grant on student support and success, right? We, um, a few years ago, we were the first ever uh, master's level university. This was before we became an R2. We were the first ever master's university to receive a, what it was called a SEBA grant, right? Centers for International Business Education. And now it was renewed, and that's Yong Soon Peck uh, um, uh, uh, and his team working on that. And then the, uh, the amazing Magali Lavadens, who does, uh, works on uh, English language learners, right? She is continually getting grants to support that, that consequential work. And you know, you saw you saw the announcements when we received our Howard Hughes Medical Institute grants. Uh, this this is a grant that is so difficult to get. Three hundred institutions were initially uh, invited to apply for this, and only six ended up getting it. Right. Uh, so kudos to Heather and the whole team uh, in Seaver who uh, who made this possible. Right. We have this Department of Education, Open Educational Resources Grant, which is very DEI focused, and that uh, is led by Dean Brancolini of the William H. Hannon Library. And that is a consortial grant. So we're working with other institutions, uh, a couple of AJCUs, and then I think one other Catholic university, uh, but we're the lead on this grant. We're leading the way for these other institutions. And then, yeah, how about a hand of applause for these grant getters? And then uh, University Advancement and Dean Cho uh, recently secured these grants for DEI efforts, right? Just incredible. These are going to be amazing uh, uh, for, for our Seaver College students. So, yeah. It also, you know, our efforts also allow us to bring in amazing speakers. And, and offer these uh, uh, speaker series, right? And uh, in case you're wondering, one of these haven't, hasn't happened yet. Uh, Wanda Austin's coming tonight, right? I'll be there. <laughs> and I'm not sure if it's open to everyone or you had to RSVP. Open, open to everyone. So come hear this amazing leader uh, talk about her experience um, uh, in the aer aerospace industry, right? Right, Tina? Yep, okay. All right. Let's move on to innovation and adaptability. Um, so one thing that Leon alluded to is our partnership, right? And I am so grateful to uh, the faculty senate leadership. We have worked really well together this year. We haven't agreed on everything, not by a long shot, right? But, um, but they have been really strong advocates for the faculty. And they've prioritized some things, right? And so. One thing that um, they've been able to do in collaboration with ITS, and the lead there has been Matt Frank, uh, they identified that they told me we need more flexible learning spaces, right? Some of our classrooms are just not up to snuff for a university of our caliber. And so together, they identified these spaces, and I'm just gonna show you a couple of them. So in University Hall, that's one of the few areas of campus that doesn't have what's called an active uh, learning classroom, right? And this is, you know, Seaver has one upstairs, Foley has one. Um, this is where you have some technology, uh, lots of technology and the ability to work in groups, move tables around. There are screens at the end of each of these tables, right? And um, what, what we've learned is those spaces that we already have are highly booked. Right? And so now we're going to have one in University Hall. Um, and then these other classrooms, these are some of the classroom spaces that have 
you know, wonky furniture or furniture that doesn't accommodate all body types, right? I'll give you one example. In St. Rob's, there's this classroom, right? <laughs> and so through the Senate, uh, Senate leadership's advocacy, we're going to be transforming this classroom. So Matt sent me some schematics. So this is what it looks like right now, and we're going to be putting in uh, movable and stackable tables and chairs. So you could have this setup if you want, you could have conference style setup if you want, you could have group work setup if you want, right? This is gonna transform the, the, the uses of these classrooms and what faculty can do in their classrooms. So thank you, Leon, for your partnership on that. But we're not done with Faculty Senate. <laughs> So they have been very strong advocates for non-tenure track faculty. And so through their advocacy, they have been able to advocate for resources for non-tenure track faculty and even policy or practice changes. And I don't expect you to uh, read all of these if you're, if you're taking score or keeping score. Again, you can watch this, fast forward it to the place, pause it so you can see exactly what they are. But I'm going to just mention the, the, the buckets that they fall under. One is teaching resources, right? We have opened up more teaching resources for non-tenure track faculty than have been provided in the past. Another is professional development outside of teaching. Uh, we've opened up more opportunities for faculty than have ever been in the past. Another is research-related offerings, right? And so again, you can see we have offerings for our non-tenure track faculty. And then one thing that um, uh, the Senate leadership really pushed for this year were things that really affect our non-tenure track faculty, right? And so things related to contracts. It turned out that we, um, we, we oftentimes were late getting contracts to clinical faculty because we had done tenure line faculty first, right, in the process. So uh, through the collaboration with the deans and their units, they agreed to, while they were waiting for those, uh, the, the tenure track processes to occur, they could start with the clinicals. And I've already been signing clinical faculty contracts in Workday, right? So they're getting them earlier now. <laughs> and then one request that came through was to consider year-long contracts for part-time faculty, right? If you know, if a department knows that a part-time faculty member and a course is needed in the fall and the spring, right, give the part-time faculty the ability to plan for in their lives, right, and offer that year-long contract. So we're, 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 we're talking to departments right now to, to consider these types of things. I want to give shout-outs to people who also collaborated to make this happen. Kat Weaver, Rebecca Chandler, Vice President for Human Resources, and Carrie Hookding, uh, Director of the CTE, and of course the deans, and you can see them back on slide 28. <laughs> yeah. Another thing I want to announce is, and this just uh, uh, speaks to our adaptability, right? We used to have two different ceremonies for students, award ceremonies. And uh, Terry and Jose put their heads together and said, let's try to uh, make one, right? Because we celebrate the whole person here. The whole person isn't academics in one thing and, you know, co-curricular stuff in another, right? And so we're going to have this April 21st. We have, was it 400 awards? No, how many awards? <laughs> 150 awards, right? 150 awards to give out in two hours. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and let's talk about the, the third commitment, which is extending our reach beyond the bluff. So our university advancement team had these beyond the bluff events all over the country, and it was great. Uh, alumni, uh, parents, right, um, uh, benefactors of the university came to these events to learn more about where we are as a university. And uh, they were headlined by President Snyder and Peter Wilch, uh, but 
they were able to get so many people uh, e either at LMU or in the Lion community to come to these events to speak. Um, it was incredible. I got to go to a couple of them and meet some great alumni. These are awesome events. Uh, so thank you, Peter and Tim, for, for doing these. And the last one is coming up in San Diego, right, in April. Um, and then I want to highlight the work of someone relatively new to LMU, and that's Jody Skandarian. She's executive director uh, for strategic partnerships and initiatives. So she got a sponsorship uh, of this Distinguished Speaker Series, which happens every year. And you can see the speakers they brought, right? Neil deGrasse Tyson, Misty Copeland, Ken Burns is coming in May, uh, Bob Eubanks, right? Uh, Christine uh, Mittermeier. Uh, we have an admiral that was there. Uh, so this photo here is some students in our ROTC program, including our commander, Nathan Chang. Uh, they got to see uh, the, the admiral give his talk. Um, we had uh, see, uh, we had executives from the aerospace industry uh, meet with some of our faculty, um, uh, and they got to go see Neil uh, deGrasse Tyson. Uh, la uh, last week, no, it was just the other day. Time flies. Uh, just the other day, uh, in, uh, some folks from admission and myself, uh, Mariana Villa, we got to sit at a table with the LA Community College District uh, Chancellor, who is also, by the way, uh, an honorary degree recipient of LMU, and his team, his presidents from the various community colleges, to reinvigor, to, to cement our partnerships with them, and to imagine new possibilities, new partnerships. And when I, and, and this is Misty Copeland, of course, where we actually got to host that event, have a lot of people come and do a Q&A with uh, Misty Copeland, as you can see here with Roz Lowe. So um, I did this table because it, it really is impactful what Jody is doing. So she is involving and collaborative. She's involving internal partners. She's connecting them with external partners. And you can see some of the outcomes, right? We're forming new LinkedIn groups. We're forming a DEI consortium of companies uh, led by Taryn Vanderhoop, professors Taryn Vanderhoop and Roz Lowe. Um, they, they offer this uh, strengthening communication workshop. Um, so I won't be able to read all of this, but we now have a partnership with the World Surf, Surf League, right? And, and our students are going to be able to be caddies to surfers when they come for the World Championships. I didn't know surfers had caddies, but of course it makes sense. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to scroll through some of these. You can see, again, some of our internal partners who met with our external partners, right? And then what these have led to. Uh, with Admiral James uh, Stratus, we had, as I mentioned before, our ROTC students. Christina Minnemeyer, who is a, a photographer, uh, met with a nature photographer, met with Eric Strauss um, and Kristen Agostoni and... Uh, there are our external partners there. We got a feature story out of that. We got a, a micro-internship opportunity for one of our students, one prospect meeting, right? Bob Eubanks, that was the one with the um, community college leaders, and we've strengthened our partnerships with them, and we're going to make new ones. So really incredible. Yeah. She's done more, and I'm going to present that. She's hosted uh, two amazing events at our Playa Vista campus, uh, one is called Hollywood 3.0, where we invited our alum, John Atanasio, who, who is a founder of Toonstar, and his partner to come. And there were panelists, a faculty. Last week, we had an AI symposium. This was an almost all-day symposium. Um, you could see the turnout at Playa Vista. It was incredible. And a lot of this was industry people, right, potential partners. Um, there was our keynote speaker. Dean Young also gave remarks. Uh, we had a, a panel with faculty and some of our industry leaders. Then a fireside chat with Tamara Armstrong and Stephen Frompkin from Tailspin. Uh, and then an afternoon panel, um, as well as an afternoon keynote with uh, Saba uh, Kidwai, right? And so then she joined the panel. So just amazing stuff. So how about another round of applause for Jody? And you can't get more off the bluff than the metaverse, okay? <laughs> so um, we had this Metaversity grant, 
And there's been some swirl around it. Well, what is the administration trying to do? Are they you know, going to make us like a, you know, name this university that has gone all in on, on virtual? Okay, so here I, I'm here to explain, okay, and clarify the what. What is it? It's a grant, folks, okay? We're not putting any significant money into it. We got a $70,000 grant uh, of cash and in-kind, right? The in-kind part are those headsets, right? And from Victory XR to create a digital twin campus. What does that mean, right? Uh, I know that word is off-putting. Well, a digital twin is actually a term, right? It's a digital representation of an object, of a process, a service, or a place, okay? That behaves and looks like its real counterpart in the real world, okay? Why would you want a digital twin? Well, first of all, let's talk about the how. So here's our digital twin campus, right? So number one, uh, LMU was approached by Victory XR as a potential recipient of a Metaversity grant, okay? And then contrary to belief, we did go through shared governance on this. We presented the opportunity to our academic technology committee, and they uh, positively recommended that we do this, okay? So, why would we want to do this? So many good reasons for research, simulation and training, testing, right? Accessibility, um, collaboration, active learning, right? We all know that when you experience something, you learn it so much better than when someone just tells you, right? And so all these things are now possible. And we have, a, not a lot, but a few faculty who have volunteered to pilot this and utilize this in their class. Right? I'm guessing they're not doing the entire class with headsets on, right? They're utilizing the resources. And one last thing, what it isn't. It's not a one-for-one -one recreation of the LMU campus, right? Only some buildings are being created, okay? Um, and it's really not meant to replace anything at all, okay? <laughs> so I hope I can put that, that notion to rest. And this would not have been possible if it weren't for uh, the great work of our, our faculty who do research in this area, but also uh, Jeff Schwartz, uh, who leads the Online Learning Center. All right. I know I'm running just a little late, but we'll, we'll get to this part. Okay. So first, I want to give some special thanks. None of this would be possible if we didn't have a leader who really believed in all the things that you saw, right? And it's his commitment to DEI for us becoming an anti-racist institution, for getting us off the bluff, right? And not being the best kept secret uh, in the world anymore, right? Without, without Tim's leadership, President Snyder's leadership, we wouldn't be where we are today. So thank you, President Snyder. And then this is special thanks, but also a little bit of sadness. We have some people leaving LMU. So Norma Romero is retiring, and she has led the Upward Bound programs for many years, providing really impactful opportunities for high school students to go to colleges like LMU. Uh, she's leaving the university, uh, retiring. Vanessa Miranda, her family moved out of state, so she chose her family. I can't believe that. Um, <laughs> But she has led our transfer programs uh, very successfully for several years now. Uh, good luck to you, Vanessa. She's working with us, though, through summer, right, Maureen? Um, Rebecca Chandler, who has been here for uh, six, 17, 18 years, something like that. Um, she's retiring uh, uh, this summer, and um, she hired almost all of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> And then last but not least, Lynn Scarborough, who has been here 23 years, uh, she's retiring as well. And, you know, I couldn't have found a better partner to uh, begin my provost position here. Um, uh, we, she has been so collaborative. She prioritizes academics. And um, it's just been a joy to work with her. And you're going to be so missed, Lynn. Thank you. All of you, of course, uh, and you know, this was about collaboration. This on, I can't.
hear it at all, but that's okay. We'll go for it. Okay, so I thought I'd sing this song. It's by uh, an artist who would have been 80 years old uh, this year. His name's Jimi Hendrix. You heard of him? Yeah. <laughs> so he wrote this song called Little Wing. It's a very short song, and um, uh, legend has it that he either wrote it uh, for his grandmother or someone he was really attracted to at a concert. Right? <laughs> Either way, uh, he did it out of admiration. And so that's why I'm playing this for you, out of admiration for this entire community. I hope I can play it. It's, it's not easy. <laughs> so I don't know why I picked the hard ones to play at these things. Um, so, and I have a little slideshow because what I realize is I have an amazing uh, job, right? I get to come to work at, at, in an amazing community. Uh, my position allows me to work with and meet so many people. And this year, with the pandemic behind us, uh, we've been able to meet more than ever. So I take pictures at some of these meetings. So I've, I've created a slideshow of some of my experiences this year. Uh, and, and it really, again, this is just to express admiration and appreciation to all of you. So this is uh, Little Wing, the ukulele version. And I'm going to sing, so that's not good, but <laughs> there are words to this song. So here we go. She's walking through the clouds with a circus mind that's running around. Butterflies and zebras and moonbeams, fairy tales. Riding with the wind. When I'm sad, she comes to me with a thousand smiles she gives me for free. It's all right, she says, it's all right. Take anything you want from me. And it's Fly on, little wing. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Lunch in the courtyard. <laughs>